We're back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. These are the times that try men's souls, said Thomas Paine, and it's as true today as it was in his time, which is one of the many reasons I always look forward to speaking with my next guest, Reverend uh, William H. Uh, Lamar the fourth is the minister, head minister at the Metropolitan AME Church here in Washington, D.C. Uh, he has a, a, what I consider to be a, a great perspective on faith and society and politics. And he wrote a piece recently that I, I especially wanted to talk with him about. So first of all, Reverend Lamar, uh, thanks for coming back on the program. My great pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And, you know, it might seem a bit strange at first that I would want to talk about a piece that you wrote essentially for fellow members of the clergy. It was published in faithandleadership.com, which is part of the Duke University Divinity School. You know, it's a publication there. And the headline was Preaching Must Speak Into and transform our understanding of conflict. And, and I think it was essentially, you know, the audience was at, at its core, maybe fellow uh, Christian ministers and then Christians in general outside of that. But really, the third circle to, to which it spoke was, in my view, was to everyone. And I think the message, I think the underlying message was, to a certain extent, addressing a universal a challenge these days in this country anyway which is how to live morally or a moral life in an immoral empire i mean that was my thematic takeaway uh is that on base off base what do you think i think you are completely on base and i think a number of things motivated uh what i was trying to convey even if you're not a preacher of sorts, and there are many ways to preach and proclaim. If you're using words and language within our context, we have to always be clear. And my argument was that scripture was clear that Jesus began his preaching ministry amid conflict. So John the Baptist is arrested, like literally taken off the scene, and ultimately he's executed. And so Jesus is clear in my opinion, that what happens to John will happen to him. So my argument for preachers and others who profess truth are leading us to truth, you must always realize that there is conflict and that there are those who will, within the law or without the law, do what is necessary to remove your voice. So a couple of things come to mind quite readily. J. Edgar Hoover began his work by persecuting Marcus Garvey. And toward the end of his work mm. was clear about eliminating Fred Hampton, who had joined in the original Rainbow Coalition, poor white folks and Hispanic Latinx folks in Chicago, organizing across lines and boundaries. There is always conflict for those who see humans as humans and who want to gather us together to live abundantly and to live flourishing lives. I mean, you think about it, the government used all of its power to do what it could to erase civil rights leaders, to erase many union leaders. There is something inherent in empire that wants to keep us apart, keep us scrambling and fighting when the true glory for humans is to come together and to share and to develop an economy that is not based on cutting people out or demonizing or dehumanizing others. So I, I wanted to speak into the fact that the text points us to the fact that there is always conflict. And I think many religious folk preach and teach in a Pollyannish reality. Some mm -hmm. people can hide from the realities that we see, but, but it's very clear that we're living in a crumbling empire, doing all it can to grasp and hold on to life when it's done so much to erode its capacity to to continue to to live amongst the community of nations and empires. So talking too much, but I, but you were right. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And I think that in one of the words that I don't think it was in the piece itself, but to me underlay uh, so much of what, what you wrote was the word courage that you know john and jesus didn't preach you know whether you believe whatever you believe about uh, their nature nothing about 
their biography suggests that they got into the profession of preaching because you know it had a good pension plan right you know what i mean it was not doing it as you said you know it was already clear uh that uh this was the path to arrest and execution this was not going to be you know an easy way to get on in the world but they did it anyway and they did it it seems to me not the theologian seemingly at peace with their destiny and i and i'm wondering if to extent some extent we're talking about among churchgoers among agnostics among preachers a lack of courage to con not only to confront the reality of empire but to even acknowledge it do you get yeah. what i'm saying wow. so there i can't remember the author but there's a, a wonderful book about how to hide an empire hide the united states oh yes not, yeah you, yeah you know the book they, they we, we don't because we don't call this an empire doesn't mean that it's not and a line that i have used so much rj that if Mal Malcolm were alive, I would owe him royalties. He says that you can put a kitten in an oven, but that doesn't make it a biscuit, right? So, <laughs> so you 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 have to interrogate. Also, I'm, I'm thinking about Du Bois's the last portion of his magisterial Black Reconstruction. He talks about the propaganda of history, about how we tend to hide from. I mean, part part of what I'm I'm, I'm writing another piece now uh, about mint julep history where the uh -huh. South demanded a certain uh, deodorized story around reconstruction, around enslavement, all of that brutal stuff. And I keep thinking about, I'm glad you mentioned courage, because what we also need to understand is there is fear. I am clear that when John, John had to have fear and so did Jesus, but they stared fear in the face and kept going. So this is not a call to be extra human or superhuman. It is to know that if if folks are after you, if power is after you, there is fear. I think about Fannie Lou Hamer and what she did in Mississippi when literally she is arrested. She is sexually assaulted uh, in prison. I think about Ida B. Wells Barnett and all of the hatred and, and, and a lot of the fact that many of her fellow black folks in my own denomination would not help her because they themselves were afraid of the wrath of of racist white folks holding power. So what I want to say is if all of us come together and call this what it is, we might be able to salvage corners of democracy, corners of hope. But I do not think it's possible if we propagandize language. So the last little bit is only like a thousand words. The last little bit is about words like freedom and liberty. So you've got right. uh, people like Ron DeSantis deploying those words, but doing their opposite. So I am calling for preachers and other folks who traffic in words like yourself, journalists and others, to interrogate the <laughs> excuse me the usages of words. If you say freedom and what you're doing is anti-freedom, you must be called out. If you say liberty, if you say justice, people don't have or should not have the, the license to do things that are against human flourishing and call them the things that make for flourishing. I think that, that much more needs to be done. I think that too many of us accommodate myself included there part of my writing this is i want to call out my own accommodation and challenge myself to be more courageous to be and to stare fear in the face because we're clear that part of what it means to be the nation state part of it, what it means to be the empire is a monopolistic control of violence right we can use right. it you can't so the story uh, of our history is that that violence is used for political purposes always has been and I don't see any reason to believe that they will not continue to use it. And um, I'm so glad for that clarification because there is an element of fear in this that I think any of us have to confront. There comes a point where in my work uh, too, where it's like, uh, you know, I'm starting to learn something and I, it's almost like I'm standing on the edge of a cliff. And if, if I really am, understand this i'm going to step off a cliff and separate myself potentially from old friends and old allies and and acquaintances because this is, realization is going to compel me to do certain things right and maybe part of me doesn't want to 
do it because part of me is afraid of the consequences of doing it. And I think that's an enormous piece of it too. And it, and it seems to me that in the context of religion, that really you're, you're calling out, it seems to me, although it's not explicitly stated, kind of two categories of Christian preacher and Christian congregation. There's, uh, and you say it is very well put, preaching is not is how the church talks to itself and to others, and, and the church is not called to speak only to itself, but is called to speak to, also to those who do not claim our Lord, but are cherished by our Lord just the same. It made me think of, I mean, you focus on the Gospel of Mark, it makes me think of John 3, you know, for, for a period of my life, uh, although I had a bar mitzvah as a Jew, I was raised by Southern Baptist relatives. And um, uh, it reminds me, you know, that term born again, right? It, 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 it's misunderstood, I think, by millions of people. I, it, you know, if you read John 3, uh, which I'm trying to uh, recall from memory, but among other things, it's basically born. It, it, it means a Nicodemus, first of all, comes up like a knucklehead. I don't. I, I can't believe a ruler was that. You mean out of the mother again? No. Um, but it says explicitly, you know, of spirit, right? And it says in the world that Jesus came not to condemn. If I recall correctly, and correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, but to enlighten. In effect, it was a different word, but that to me is like now we hear born again use especially you know when i was you know part of that it was many years ago and uh you didn't have the politiz politicization that you have today of that southern baptist white congregation right you did, i mean their preacher was brother gene he had an auto body shop right and he he may not have been the most learned theologian but he stayed out of politics and but even then we're born again was misunderstood but it seems because it wasn't us against them right it wasn't well i'm washing the blood and you're not it was you know uh, 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 cleansed by water and spirit meaning renewed right I mean, i'm talking too long but uh you're the guest but it seems to me that one of the two uh, groups you're targeting here are the ones who have taken that and weaponized it for lack of a better word uh what what is that well, uh, look, does that I, make sense to yes you? i think you're What's onto that? something because in john 3 the word for god so loved the cosmos it does not say for god so loved the church or for god right. so loved the christians so a sectarian understanding that we're in and you're out is problematic cosmos means all that is created all of human beings and when we grasp at the gospel, and, and I can't speak to other faiths, but my read of the gospel, to use it as a weapon of exclusivity, to exclude people, we fundamentally miss what it's about. I mean, the, the book of Acts is about including people, a la Gentiles, who were not included before in the economy of salvation, as most folk understood it. Now, I want to pivot back to something that you said, or, or really connect God loving the cosmos with the fact that in Mark and other gospels, people would argue that God shows up on the scene, uh, according to Christian incarnational theology, <laughs> as Jesus. And one of the things I want to recover is the power structure should always, in, in many ways, despise the church its proclamation mm -hmm. and its politics. Where the power structure is simpatico with the church, the church has a problem. I think whether that is uh, folks being simpatico with Ronald Reagan or being simpatico with Barack Obama, that you right. still have folks who fundamentally are caretaking the American empire from the left or from the right and, and not to to, to dismiss the humanity of elected leaders, but the church's vocation is different and is called, we're called to hold. So I, I try to do work here locally with political leaders and with others. And it's, it's difficult, RJ, because you're sitting across the table from someone who is powerful, trying to get something more just done. And they come to you at, with practicality with, this is all we have. This is all we can do. This is this. And you're, 
always in a space of churning, trying to figure out how do I show up authentically according to what I profess amid power and its accoutrement and its seductions. Right. And, And these are questions with which we have to wrestle. If there is no wrestling, if there is no awareness that on the other side of the table from you, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, are powerful people seeking to maintain and extend power, then we have a problem. And then I, I could I really want to stretch this to where you I mean you bring up soteriology, salvation. What what does salvation mean? In the richness of salvation is not just what we've interpreted like individuals dying and going to heaven. As a matter of fact, that's that's Jesus didn't mean dying and go to heaven, going to heaven at all. That this salvation about which he spoke was human beings living in the shalom of God, meaning salvation is my physical needs are met. I'm housed, I'm clothed, I'm cared for, I am loved, not just in the next world, but in this world. And the problem with the prevailing theological discourse and the prevailing theological and intellectual infrastructure, according to white evangelicalism, is they prioritize souls over bodies. But really, if you get at it, they prioritize their own bodies, but not the bodies of those who are outside. Uh, one of the, this is really essentializing, but, but I commend to your to your viewers and listeners, Willie Jennings book, Christian Imagination, when ultimately, when the Portuguese, who are, are pretty much at the fountainhead of, of, of European uh, imperial conquest and enslavement and all that kind of stuff, they were Catholics. And when they encountered Africans and natives, they had a theological question. If we baptize them, what must we treat them as brothers and sisters? And what the church said, the Catholic church said is essentially their bodies are ours, their souls are God's. And that's still the prevailing theology in America, that, that we're concerned about souls. So come on and get saved as an individual. But in scripture, salvation is always communal. Right. It is it is the saving of the people of God. So I've talked enough, but but I really no, no. Abso- and I just wanted to point out, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, both uh, Donald Trump and Barack Obama or whatever. To me, the big challenge I have often is that um, in my own work is that i'm not saying that democrats for example can't be useful can't be you know that they can't be allied with to accomplish certain things for the greater good but people the politics of celebrity the politics of you know i adore obama or i adore this one or i adore that one i mean to me it's idolatry and it it gets in the way which you know, Obama's Obama. He took a job managing an empire. That was the job he wanted. It's the job he got, you know, uh, showed great skill in going for it and getting it. But, and I respect those skills, but I mean, I am not part of that system, right? So, so if I worship somebody because they're charismatic or because they look like me and I, I want somebody to look like me to be president or whatever it might be, I think I, you know, religious, agnostic, spiritual, you know, whatever I call myself, I feel like I've strayed from my human mission. Well, let, let me say this. I think you're exactly right. I think about Mr. Obama. I, 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 say I never met him. I did shake his hand one time when he came to the church for a funeral or something. Um, he was a community organizer trained in the Saul Alinsky model. And, and I'm, I'm right. a part of, of that world which means he clearly understood how power worked and the history of power using violence to accomplish its ends. And the Alinsky model is about building power because you will never be able to convince people morally to do something. You've got to build power to counteract their power. And a lot of people have problems with that, but that's that's an essentialization of, of, of that philosophy. What I would say is that when Mr. Obama made a decision to go into elected politics, he decided another avenue of power to make change. And I think that he knew and knows the warts of exercising power within the milieu of elected politics in the United States of America. He knows, (laughs) I think he's a a very intelligent man, he knows what had been done in the name of this, this empire. And I think he's aware possibly of what he would have to do to maintain it. And he did some stuff 
that uh, I would argue uh, with morally. But part of the reason I don't want that job is because I don't want to have to make those decisions. And I am not willing to give ultimate loyalty to this empire because I don't believe it gives against ultimate loyalty to human beings, uh, to the masses of human beings. I think it gives ultimate loyalty to those who have the power to control and influence. It. So to, to to stretch that, I think that the church has to ask and people who are moral and ethical have to ask to whom or to what will they give ultimate loyalty. And that again is a struggle because of our own being uh, able to be seduced and our own desire for power to maintain our comforts. Um, but I look at the lives of so many, and we could name many uh the the Kings and the Dorothy Days and and um the list is on goes on and on of people who show us that it is possible to set up colonies of faithfulness. And colony is not the right word, but I'll I'll use it to carve out small spaces where humans can flourish and and I'm just, I, I, I become more and more despondent, RJ, when I look at our tax structure and how that reinscribes power and wealth. The ways that we have redlined, the ways that we have criminalized, uh, the way that they're essentially, and I mean, I, I hate to use these tropes, but there's socialism for the wealthy and capitalism for the poor. I mean, at the most difficult economic time that, that I can remember, you know, 2007, 2008, we bailed out the banks and these damn people got bonuses. They they extracted from public funds. I mean, it, it shows you that I can't remember. It may have been uh, Kwame Ture Stokely Carmichael who said the definition of America is a people who have no shame. If you are already wealthy and bank owner, stock owner, government bails you out. And instead of doing anything in the interest of the broader population and community, you extract a pornographic bonus from public money given you to keep you afloat. I just, I mean, there, there is there is little shame and that's a problem. Ultimately, I, I just want to contend that it's a matter of loyalty uh, and us discerning to whom or to what we will give ultimate loyalty and I don't ever want to pretend like there is not fear, possibly danger in that. But but I just believe um, that Mao says that women hold up half the sky. And there's so many other beautiful uh, thoughts around the fact that there are some righteous people who do righteous stuff. And that allows us to continue in this often messy yet beautiful world that I, I feel like I'm called and many of us are called to try to show an alternative. But what I wanted to lift up in this piece was that the alternative costs. And I believe that many of us are unwilling to do what is necessary to pay costs so that we can thrive together. There is abundance. And uh, where we are in the American empire, a huge piece of its maintenance of power is the rhetoric of scarcity. There's not enough. There's not enough. Well, I was talking to a dear friend of mine recently, and he said a billionaire is a is proof of a failure of public policy. Right. Nobody should be able to accumulate like that. There's a, so it, it's it's never that there's not enough. It's that those who have are not willing to share. And when you read the scripture, RJ, I never when I was growing up, the the prophets are the, they are replete with pay workers a fair wage. Don't let justice be corrupted. Don't don't let judges shouldn't be bought and you should not trample the houses of widows. Like it, this seems to deeply be ingrained in human nature. And and there's work to do to move in another direction. And uh, uh, speaking of the prophets, I think Isaiah has earned a lifetime posthumous membership in the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this gets to a point uh, and, and looping back to the subject of courage and so on. I had the uh, journalist and author. I've had the journalist and author Chris Hedges on the show a number of times. Also a trained theologian like yourself, by the way. But um I asked him in the first interview when I think he was still a little wary of me, like was I a democratic mouthpiece or whatever. But uh I asked him, I said, you know, you've you covered, you know, Tiananmen Square, 
uh, revolutionaries, uh, people who put their lives on the line, many of whom died, you know, the man who stood in front of the tank at Tiananmen. And I said, you know, what I've seen from a distance from all these people, you know, whether they're religious, atheist, whatever, is a serenity, a kind of serenity that, that radiates. I'm sure they feel fear. I'm sure they feel loss. But I said, why do you think that is? And there was a long pause and he said, because they've chosen. So in a sense, I think you're talking about a choice here, aren't you, Reverend Lamar? I mean, you're talking about, uh, do you want to choose uh, to come? compromise with an unjust system or do you want to choose to see it for what it is and potentially take the consequences that might arise from that let me tell you uh, you living with a professor of literature is a great gift and there are two images that come to mind one my wife sharing with me uh from ralph ellison's the invisible man where there's a scene where the characters are are not arguing but discussing freedom and someone is saying, I don't really know what it is, but I feel like I'll know it when I see it. Right. Or in The Salt Eaters, which is, I think, one of my wife's favorite novels uh, by Tony K. Bambara, where one of the wise women says to someone else, do you really want to be free? It talks, they talk about the burden right. of freedom. Or, you know, the, the story of the exodus in the text, where the people are like, nah, we're going to turn around and go back. This This is... It's not good. Or, I mean, much of my, and I've written and thought about this a lot, my politicization uh, came from music. And one of, one of the mm. albums that really, really moved me forward was Public Enemies. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. And there's a riff on that album that says freedom is a road seldom traveled by the multitude. It's so all of this artistic production around freedom. And I, I, re I like Chris Hedges a lot. I've learned a lot of reading and watching uh, his writing his, and his thinking. And you're right. We have to choose it. We have to choose it. And it is it's a difficult choice, but I do believe that there is some serenity that comes with it. There's, there's a clarity that comes with making that choice because yeah. what you do then is you cut certain things off from coming to you but you open up other things coming to you. So there's certain places because of what I think and say, uh, I won't, I won't get invited into certain rooms, but there are other rooms where I am invited. And what I am finding more and more in my life is, as I commit to this choice and I grow in courage and practice the disciplines that allow me. And I, I really hope, I, I hope this is the case too, RJ, that whatever truth I may be gifted to see that I never become self-righteous, that I never become someone who browbeats, but but I want to speak out of a kind of love and out of a kind of wrestling uh, that, that I have come uh, to a decision to think in a certain way and to try to live in a certain way. And finally, to say that this cannot be done in isolation. One must find communities of persons to live this way. And, and I'm thankful that I've got that kind of community. And I, I, before, you know, I want to make sure uh, that we also touch on the other uh, population I think you were talking about within the Christian world, although I think there are analogs elsewhere. We talked about, you know, the, uh, the white Southern Baptist evangelicals, nationalists, so on and so on. But you also, you also talk about, uh, I, I'm looking at, uh, 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 churches that are committed to, uh, I'm quoting you, American global dominance, as long as that dominance has the patina of kindness and exclusion. You know, th th this to me is so important that there is a kind of, uh, dare I say, liberal, well-intentioned, uh, or seemingly well-intentioned, uh, you know, I, what comes to mind is my friend Thomas Frank, is a great writer on politics, pointed out that, uh, you know, in Chevy Chase, where he lives, uh, you can walk around, you see all these signs, you see some around my neighborhood too here, that that say, you know, we believe that love is love and, and uh, you know, race doesn't, black lives matter and the color of your skin doesn't matter and, and uh, you know, all these touchy-feely things. But as Tom Frank points out, they don't say that nobody 
uh, should work and starve, that nobody at all should starve, that poverty shouldn't exist, and that nothing economic. It's all, you know, it makes me think of the bank CEOs taking the knee with Colin Kaepernick, which is like, you know, the same freaking banks, excuse me, who redlined black communities, took billions and billions of dollars from black communities, have never talked about reparations. They haven't even given that money back. And now they take the knee or they put black square for Black Lives Matter on the CEO's Twitter feed or whatnot. I feel like, and I'm getting agitated because these people aggravate me so much, but I feel like that was the second community of Christians you were addressing. Is that oh, fair? Oh, yes. And you know, a good friend of mine has has developed, and it's, these are ideas that he's conflated, but he talks about blackness and whiteness, not as phenotypes, but as ways of seeing the world and how the world ought be ordered. Very much like when when James Cone is writing about blackness, he, he doesn't mean people who are phenotypically black, but people who side with the oppressed. And, and what is fascinating, I've, I've, I have taken RJ to, uh, and, it, and it took Angela Davis, I was listening to her, and she was talking about people use, are afraid of the word revolution because it conjures images of what is that which is bloody and violent but she says it, it doesn't have to be that way often humans have lacked the moral imagination to make it something other than that but we need i was talking to a group on saturday fundamental revolution economically and politically so i think about something that malcolm x said that stirred me again i mean this this he probably is one of the clearest intellects of the last 20th of the last century he said would you rather be eaten by wolves or by foxes <laughs> white conservatives are foxes right. are, are wolves and the liberals are foxes so again this patina of support i wrote uh, a while back about um how sentimentality doesn't change things right so the sentiment of kneeling the sentiment of black lives matter i think that frank is right that if you're not talking about fundamentally reordering this economy such that wealth does not float from those who are poor to the wealthy but that wealth flows in a fairer way that we have a view of what the world is and that it, all things cannot be owned, commoditized, that the profit motive that we now see is in education, it is in healthcare, everything that human beings need to survive, we have figured out how to commoditize. That that right. that, that is something that speaks to a fundamental sickness of a culture where we need shelter, that's commoditized. Uh, we need education. That's commoditized. We need health care. That's commoditized. Right. We lack our our moral imaginations are so poor. And, and what I'm arguing, and I think what you and others uh, are arguing is we got to fundamentally redo this. But but we know that there are people who do are not interested in that, who will use all their power to keep it from happening. But in the words of the poet Sterling A. Brown from Howard University, the strong men, the strong women keep coming. We, we we can't relent. We can't retreat. We have to continue to try our very best to move this in a more human direction. It's, it's really sad. It's, it's really, really sad to see those who think that they have exonerate, exonerated themselves by taking a picture with, you know, a few poor people or putting a sign in the yard. That's you, that's not not much. Well, I'm going to use a curse word now. I apologize Please in do. advance, but I'm quoting a poet. So, and Troy, you're going to, I apologize to Troy for having to edit it later for broadcast, but the poet Robinson Jeffers said they'd shit on the morning star if they could. That was his, you know, that to me says it all. So if you don't confront that, wow. you know, and particularly speaking as a, as, as a member of the white community, uh, identified white that, you know, it turns into if you leave economic justice out of the equation it turns into and forgive me for saying this too but a fetishization of black people and blackness because it's it, if i say for example i do a lot in healthcare if i say as a white person racism is causing the high number of uh, you know infant mortality rates uh, among 
black mothers, complications among black mothers, uh, shorter lifespan for black people. Yes, racism in the delivery of health care is part of it. But if I leave out the economic factors that drive that, not only am I dividing black from white, because there are poor white people too who need help, but I'm also, and I've talked with you know a lot of people about this, I'm also reinforcing that racist trope that says that black bodies are different from white bodies when it comes to health and medicine, that they respond differently, you know, this body is different from me. And so it's racism in the service of posing as the good liberal. And to me, that's part of, of, of your, your message too, but um, maybe not. But uh, well, I, I agree. I, th I think it, it definitely is. And let's be clear, too, that the best mascots of empire, the best avatars are black people done well, gone well. Yeah. Like you get two or three in the boardroom or two or three here. Two. I, I, I am fundamentally opposed to the notion that black people in high places means that we change the system. It does not mean that at all. It means that there are black people in high places. And many of those people know that in order to stay there, you know, they have to play by the tune that is being played. And let's be honest, like we don't expect the white people there to play by a different tune. So you probably shouldn't expect the black people to play by a different tune either. So this is this is insidious. It is um you know when we were doing some organizing, we were <laughs> talking about the coctopus. The the, the right, right, right. The right. So there there is, you know, there are many tentacles to this thing, just just stretching out. And we have to be very aware. And, you know, uh, another writer uh, said uh, uh, to some people, uh, liberalism uh, or justice is when the committee that decides who to illegally kill with drones is uh, perfectly representative of all races and genders. You know, it's <laughs> no, that's not, you know, I mean, look. The, 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 uh, Jesus uh, had the, and Pontius Pilate had the Sanhedrin, uh, you know, but the Jews were still oppressed, right? And the Roman Empire was still oppressive. So as you write, what the gospel is, the Roman Empire was not. What the gospel is, the American Empire is not. There's so much more we could talk about, um, but I'll leave it with this thought from you. And then if you have any closing thoughts or not, you, you point out that the story of Jesus is one of salvation. You say, God did not send Jesus to die. God sent Jesus to teach us how to live and love and we lynched him so uh it's time we learned from that and other moral lessons in our past and uh it, but i'll give you the last oh, the last word. word is this i appreciate you sharing that the reason i abide by this story and order my life and we all order our lives by story is because what god ultimately does it says no to our death no to our theology politics and economics of death that is what resurrection is for me whether people believe it literally metaphorically that god is a god of life and resurrection says i will not allow your and, and this is the thing we have conflated it into and this this is the power the insidious power of of white evangelicalism as it is practiced in its worst forms you essentialize resurrection to something that happens to this one man but what god is saying is no to your politics of death, your theology of death, your economics of death. That's the beauty of Easter tide, which comes upon us, is that there is a strident no to death. And I think about people in my family, I'm sure you think about people in your own who had difficulties, but they found ways to keep living. They never allowed their humanity to be taken from them. And that too, is of a peace with resurrection. And so I want us to live into that life, not just for some, but for all. And RJ, I really appreciate the work that you do. And, and I appreciate you very, very much. And I appreciate you coming on the program. Again, my guest has been Reverend William H. Lamar the Fourth of Metropolitan AME Church here in Washington. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll be right back. I'm Richard RJ Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.